Thanks, everybody. Welcome to my talk. This QR code links to a live book, which is supplementary to this presentation. I created the QR code with Diffusion B, which is built on top of Stable Diffusion and is an OSX app, where you can input text and it generates a picture for you. It also has the option to upload a JPEG, in this case a QR code, to use as inspiration while generating the picture. The title of my talk is Learn Stochastic Gradient Descent in Under 30 Minutes. From this point forward, I will refer to Stochastic Gradient Descent as SGD, which is a common acronym. But before we start, a little intro. My name's Eric, and when I'm not programming, I enjoy spending time with my daughter, Georgina. We go to the park often. <laughs> Thanks. I also like cooking and painting. Uh, I've also tried to develop a decent running and lifting habit. If anyone would like to talk about running, lifting, or toddlers at any point in the, this conference, I'd be more than happy. Uh, I've been developing web apps for a little over 10 years, and I currently work at cars.com. We're hiring. So why learn SGD? SGD is an integral building block to optimizing neural networks. Andre Kaparthi states, microgrid is what you need to train a neural network. Everything else is just efficiency. When ChatGPT is predicting the next word in a sentence, it optimized its weights and gradients using some form of SGD. By the end of this talk, I hope that you'll understand the following line of code, what mean squared error and SGD are doing. It took me a long time to fully grok what SGD was doing under the hood. Throughout my learning journey, two resources stand out as extremely helpful classes. These are Fast.ai by Jeremy Howard and Building Microgrid by Andre Kaparthi. I've taken many iterations of the Fast.ai course where you learn interesting and fun things like being able to build an image identifier which identifies grizzly, brown, or teddy bear photos. The most interesting side project I've done through the Fast.ai course is to build an image identifier to identify overexposed and underexposed photos. It's great we can build neural networks in Elixir nowadays on top of NX and Axon. Previously, when I wanted to train a neural network with Fast.ai, I'd have to relearn old Python concepts that I don't use very often. But now, with, with the emergence of NX and Axon, we have the ability to do fun things like enter Kaggle competitions, use hunk and face models, or build image identifiers to identify grizzly, brown, or teddy bear photos. We'll be taking the learning from first principles approach in order to learn SGD. What do I mean by first principles? I mean that we'll, we will break down things into the simplest layer and continually build complexity on top. A personal example for me is when I learned to paint from the Evolve Artist course. At first, as you can see, you just paint blocks and try to net have specks of canvas show through. I think I did a pretty decent job, but I needed to make some progress. Further on throughout the course, we learned things like developing gradients, which give the illusion of more depth to your photo. Moving on from there, you learn how to paint gradients and highlights, which further gives a lifelike illusion. After much practice and much time, I graduated on to learning to paint with colors. We'll take a similar approach to learning how SGD works. So what does that mean? The easiest thing to start with in the most basic building block would be the definition. Stochastic is a fancy math term which basically just means randomly distributed. Gradient is the slope or inclination of a function, and descent means the act of falling or moving downwards. So putting these all together, SGD means it's basically an optimization function that ultimately weaves its way and nudges its way downward through a path to find the minimum of a function. This is what it sort of looks like in action. This GIF was pulled from Wikipedia, 
And as you notice, the black lines slowly nudge their way down and fit the function going down the gradients to the lowest point on the graph. And here's the QR code in case you missed it the first time. I'll leave this up here for a second. And while I leave it up here, the first part of this talk, we will re-implement the micrograd framework, at least part of it, in Elixir through this live book. And then in the second part of this presentation, we'll use NX in order to, re to solve for a linear function. But first, a slight aside. We need to learn a few calculus ingredients in order to solve for SGD. But don't be afraid. The math is very straightforward. This is one rule to find the derivative of a function in calculus. For the rest of this talk, we'll use y equals 2x as our example. So the derivative using this rule to find y equals 2x, once you go through all the steps, the answer is 2. In other words, the derivative is telling us the sensitivity to change for this particular function. Here it is graphed out. For example, if you x input is 1, it's going to double the value to 2. 2 to 4, 3 to 6, and so forth. The second important thing that we will need to use in order to calculate SGD is the chain rule. The chain rule kind of helps us, gives us relationships between different objects through an intermediate value. A good intuitive example of this that I also pulled from Wikipedia is if a car travels twice as fast as a bicycle and a bicycle is four times as fast as a walking man, then the car travels two times four or eight times as fast as the man. We will take advantage of this rule in order to calculate through backpropagation the gradients in a neural network. So here's where things get interesting. Now, from the live book, we can construct a node struct that has three public fields. Data, which is like a scalar value or simply a number. Grad or gradient, which is what we will use to calculate the de derivative from information stored in this anonymous backward function. And label, which is like a helper function, which we will use in order to graph our node trees. Again, backward stores information that we will use later when we call backprop in order to set the gradient values. Op is the operation, like addition or multiplication. And children are a list of child nodes that we will build up to make a tree. Here's a simple example of how you would perform an addition operation using the node module. We have a node with a data value of 2 and a node with a data value of negative 3. If you add them together, it creates a new node, the parent node, with a data value of negative 1. Again, negative 3 plus 2, it's negative 1. And here's how you would do multiplication. You have the data value of 2 and the data value of negative 3, again, but with the multiplication, the data value of negative 6. Here's a more interesting and complex example. First, let's add those two nodes together, 2 and negative 3. And then let's add 10, the result being 4. It took me a while to come up with a decent way to understand how to illustrate gradients going backwards through a network of tree nodes. But I think this does a decent job. What does it mean in terms of addition? If we start off with a gradient of 1 for our parent node, our data D label, then the gradients just flow backwards. So in this example, you can see that the native 6 and 10 nodes, E and C, have the gradient of 1. But things get a little more spicy when you go back and try to multiply. In this case, when you call backprop, there's, in the anonymous function, it has data stored in order to calculate the gradients for both of these numbers. In this case, for the B node, you would multiply the A node's data value times the gradient, and vice versa for the B node. OK, so taking it full circle, what would happen if you actually wanted to understand what increasing the data value of A would mean in practice? So let's increase data A from 2 to 3. OK, what does that mean? It means that we would expect the data value of our output node D to decrease by 3 
right? So let's multiply 3 and negative 3, which would give us 9, excuse me, negative 9, and then add 10, which would give us 1, which is what we'd expect based on that grad gradient value of negative 3 for our A labeled node. OK, now that we understand how gradients work in a tree of nodes, let's move on to numerical elixir. Numerical elixir is an, a hex package which allows you to perform linear algebra operations on tensor values. So you might be asking yourself, what's a tensor? Tensors are just simply lists. Under the hood, they're a little more complicated, but all we need to know is that a rank 0 tensor is just a tensor with one value. A rank 1 tensor is a list of values. A rank 2 tensor would be a list of lists or a table of numbers. And a rank 3 tensor, just for fun, it would be a table of tables. I couldn't come up with a decent visual of this, but imagine if you wanted to represent a JPEG RGB value with tensors. You would have a table with R pixel values, a table of blue pixel values, and a table of red pixel values, and then you'd stack them all on top of each other. And that is how you would represent a JPEG in Tensorland. Another fun thing that we sort of need to know about is the defn function defined in NX. The NX defn function allows us to compile function codes and take advantage of using compilation and compute linear algebra, linear algebra operations on the GPU. So going forward, when we encounter defn, it's not a typo. It's defn. Again, here's our friend y equals 2x. This is what we're going to solve for using SGD. So the ingredients we need in order to solve for this are WB, a learning rate, and a loss function. The examples given from the rest of this talk are from a blog post by Sean Moriarty. So WB. They're also called attributes in machine learning land, and they're simply just two random numbers. These are the numbers we will be updating in order to fit the function. The learning rate is a hyperparameter, which is a fancy way of saying it's something that you, as the machine learning practitioner, get to send. It's typically a very small number, and that's because you don't want it to be too small, or else it'll take your network a very long time to fit. Conversely, you don't want the learning rate to be too high, or your function might, the SGD function might never find the local minimum. The next thing we need to know about in order to set up SGD is the loss function. The loss function tells you how far off your prediction is from the actual value. A common loss function is called mean squared error, which looks like this. But abstractly, it's hard, like, what do these numbers mean? So let's go through a graphical example, and then I will set these numbers. So our blue line is our old friend, y equals 2x. The blue dot, however, was the guess, which is 2, which is not the correct answer for. So we have a predict function that generated the number 2. Our correct answer is 4. So we subtract those two numbers and then square it, giving us a mean square error loss of 4. Our goal here is to minimize the mean squared error. The update function is what we use in order to calculate the gradients and update our activation w and b values. So here it is in a loop. You have the gradient which calls mean squared error, which makes a prediction, which updates the gradients, and then you do that over and over and over again, which will eventually fit our function y equals 2x. Let's see an example of how this manual process would work, just calling the update function once. As we can see here, we created two random numbers. Those are our activations, or WBs. Then let's generate some test data 
which reflect y equals 2x. 0.244 times 2 is 0.488. Then we call the update function one time with those activations or random numbers and the x and y. Remember, we want these numbers to reflect 2 and 0. Why? Because we're doubling the output, which is represented by this w, or 0 0.733, and the b is just 0, because we're not using uh, this number to represent anything. Let's go through it one more time, just to solidify these ideas. The activations, just random numbers and tuples. The data, which represent y equals 2x with just some randomly generated numbers but specifically equaling y equals 2x, and then update, which is slowly updating the gradients, and eventually these numbers will be 2 and 0. So instead of just doing one manually updated gradient thing, let's have a train function. Let's train for 100 epics. What is this going to do? The data is our actual x, y equals 2x values. Let's take a batch of them. And then we'll take a batch of real y equals 2x numbers and call the update function 100 times on it to update the gradient. What would this do? From the live book, if we have our data stream, which has the y equals 2x functions, and call train on it, it'll loop over our data 100 times, generating a model where the weight value is 2 and the y value is 1.19 to the negative 8, which is basically 0. So now when we have our model that we know is trained correctly, we can actually have it call predict, in this case 2, and since our model is y equals 2x, we can see that the number it outputs is 4. To make this a little more granular, let's see what the output is after the first five epics. As you can see, the first number in the tuple is slowly going up towards 2, which is our w, and then the b is slowly going down towards 0. So this is our update function being called, and it's slowly converging upon our function y equals 2x. I hope at this point, you have an intuitive understanding of what this mean squared error and SGD atoms are doing in Axon. So let's take this step back and think about the next layer of complexity from first principles. We have W and B, but instead of just applying those principles to a single linear function, in a neural network, you have a W and B for all the green and blue layers, which could be billions of nodes in a network. And at the end of the day, it's hand-wavingly doing the same thing and slowly updating those W and B layers for each node in the network every time you call back propagation, slowly resulting in fitting a function. Here are the resources I used in order to make this presentation. Thank you.